Good afternoon, teammates. Uh, Dennis Lamaster here with Command Sergeant Major Sharpentier on our 28th centennial live virtual uh, Facebook live town hall. Uh, many more to come, but uh, it's good to be back. I stepped out for a couple of weeks, and this is the first time myself and Command Sergeant Major Sharpentier are doing one together. But we got a number of things to chat with you about today. We got New mission, vision, and lines of effort, uh, return to the workplace, uh, a number of things which I'm excited to share with you. But before we go into any detail on that, I'd like to offer the, the mic up to Sergeant Major. Hey, thanks, sir. It's great being back, too. And, and just want to let everyone know that as we're both back, uh, neither of us were absent for any COVID-related absence. Uh, not that it is uh, anything adversarial if you do get COVID, but just to let you know that uh, you know other missions are, are required and, and we're still working towards accomplishing every mission that the Med COE has to include keeping you safe and keeping you informed. So uh, as CG said, we've been uh, having this opportunity for a long time, I think uh, seven or eight months now, that uh, we've had the opportunity to share information through the virtual space. and. I appreciate the continued feedback that I'm getting from many of you saying that this is beneficial, helpful, and you enjoy the opportunity to be able to, to hear from the command. So having that feedback is incredibly important, and I do appreciate that feedback. Uh, so I know uh, today we're going to have uh, discussions about lots of things, and I know that uh, there's a lot of interest in the return to the workplace plan because it is something that sits on everyone's mind because it is something that is impacting people and is impacting lives. So uh, before we get to that, you know, I, I just want to say thanks. You know, you as an individual, you as a member of our team, whether you are a soldier, whether you're a civilian employee, whether you're a family member, whether you're a retiree, extended family members, you are all working together to help us get past this. You know, this, uh, this enemy, this invisible, silent thing that we've been facing has is, is been a challenge. And it's caused a lot of people a lot of angst, a lot of worry. And a lot of people uh, have had to struggle through this time frame. And I just want to say thanks to each one of you for your parts, your efforts in helping us to uh, combat this enemy. So seems like years ago, but I know it was just months ago, earlier this year. Uh, it, it seemed like always, as, as I was walking around, spending a lot of time being the mask police, uh, spending a lot of time uh, going out and, and just being frustrated as I walked around because people were not wearing face coverings, people were not social distancing, and it kind of got to a point where, you know, COVID fatigue took another level for me because it got to the point where I just didn't even really want to walk around and see that anymore just because it was so tiring. And, and for me to not want to see people was just incredibly uh, depressing to me. So uh, I appreciate all of the steps that each one of you have taken that now it's becoming more of a habit. And it's becoming, uh, you, know, you grab your car keys, you grab your cell phone, you grab your face covering and you head out the door. And people are actually, for the most part, remembering to wear them most times. So thank you for making my job easier. I do appreciate that. Uh, you know, it, it's not always uh, the, the best feeling to, to be the, the, uh, the bad voice. So having the opportunity to, to look people in the eye and, and thank them for wearing their masks and thank them for doing the right thing is incredibly important. So the other thing I want to say is that for any naysayers out there that are saying, hey, it's not that bad. The disease is, is not being transmitted. We don't need to wear a mask. It is the contrary. The reason it's not spreading, the reason that we're not having uh, a lot of problems is because people are wearing face masks, face coverings, and doing the right things, and making sure that they are social distancing and washing their hands. So I just ask everyone to remain vigilant, remain diligent and vigilant because the fight isn't over. We still have a lot of work to do, but we're winning. Okay, winning matters. Cool. Thanks, sir. Winning matters. Winning does matter. Yes, absolutely. Uh, so let's launch into our content here. So, you know, one of the, one of the themes that has been continuous throughout our, our uh, 
our town hall sessions is that the TRADOC mission, our mission, has continued. We, the, the, the Army keeps rolling along. And um, uh, two big things. The staffs continue to grind. Uh, the TRADOC staff has, has revised the campaign plan to version 2.0. And then up at CAC, uh, uh, General Rainey and the team, has, they've got their, they had their initial assessment and they got their direction they want to go. And uh, the timing really has been fortuitous because that aligned us to get, that allowed us to get us aligned underneath both CAC and TRADOC uh, and organize uh, our campaign plan and so that we support those efforts. And I, you know, for those of you that, that uh, are on Outlook, and, and I sent this out last week, but it is really our updated mission, vision, and our lines of effort. And I encourage you to take a look at it because it's kind of where we are going to, uh, how we're going to make organizational adjustments to get after uh, our nine priorities. So I, I know we're, we're, we are familiar with the vision statement, and that statement remains unchanged, and I'll just read it to you, is that we are... The foundation on which Army medicine is built, sustained, and transformed. Our mission statement has been changed. And the Medical Center of Excellence develops leaders and drives change in Army medicine to prepare the Army to compete and win in large-scale combat operations against peer threats and multi-domain contested environments. So that's our new mission statement. Our lines of effort. We are at three, and, there, and we really borrowed from CAC on two of those. It's uh, leader development is the first one. The second one is drive change. And I, when I talk about driving change, we're talking about driving institutional change along the dot mill PF spectrum uh, uh, into Army medicine, but also taking the Army profession and driving it into the Army medicine profession as well. And then finally, the third one, or is inform our inform line of effort and hats off to to the DCOM team uh, uh, MedVid uh, we got Captain uh, Matty Wild who's joined us from the 32nd Med Brigade who's joined the team and you've probably noticed a lot more uh, effort uh, synergized synchronized effort uh, in getting our message out there into uh, the, the virtual space social media uh, all various different kinds of mediums which we have to share information and tell our story, tell your story, because we continue to do great things. Uh, but I just encourage you, if you've if you got an Outlook account, you, you, you look through, do a search, and look for that email. It's a very simple document to read, three minutes tops, but it kind of shows you where we're going right now. So with that, I'd like to give Sergeant Major a chance to yeah. comment. Thanks, sir. So, you know, as we look at, you know, that priority, that mission, those things that we're required to do, developing leaders, and that starts on day one that a soldier enters the Army, the day one that a civilian joins our organization. It doesn't matter what their rank, what their position is, every single person is a leader. And so providing those tools, providing the, the abilities, the knowledge, the attributes, the skills, enhancing those, and working towards developing those is critical and paramount because somewhere in our formation in the Medical Center of Excellence is the future MedCOE Commanding General. Somewhere in our formation is the future Surgeon General of the Army, the Command Sergeant Major of Medical Command, or the Medical Center of Excellence Command Sergeant Major. So we got to start developing those people today and now. And as far as developing our leaders in the civilian cohort, equally as important because somewhere there is someone that just got hired into our system for the first time that will eventually rise to the rank of deputy to the commanding general. So developing leaders starts on day one, and it continues throughout the entire career. Yep. Thanks, sir. And Sergeant Major, and, and I just want to foot stomp one of your points, is one of the philosophical difference between the United States Army in other nations' armies is the fact that we look at every single soldier as a leader. Uh, and, and that is something we inculcate from the very beginning is leadership and, and uh, taking charge uh, when a time steps up. Um, the Army has instituted uh, its new people strategy, and part of that is a, a 
concept called project inclusion. And we have aligned our efforts underneath this to support project inclusion. And a while ago, uh, a couple months ago, uh, we, start, we stood up our diversity and inclusion uh, operational planning team, and they have really made some, some tremendous work. Uh, and part and parcel to that is standing up the Ready and Resilient Council, and we had several of our several meetings already. Uh, and some of the working groups that are part of all this is a life worth living, which goes towards suicide prevention, uh, sexual assault, harassment prevention working group, uh, and some others. This all gets to building a cohesive team. This all gets to building trust uh, and, and kind of bringing all, all of us, aligning all of us to Army values, uh, especially our younger soldiers who have just joined our, our force. You know, one of the things that I got a foot stop against, again, uh, with, with uh, um, the Director of Communications, uh, Medvid, and as we, we put together a Together We Serve video. It's on YouTube. It's, it's awesome. I, I really like it. I think it's, I think it's you know, Hollywood-level uh, material. It just takes a minute or two to view. But I encourage you to go visit it, and, and uh, we're going to have more of these. Uh, and if you feel like sharing your story, um, go ahead and share it with the story of hashtag serve together. So, sorry, maybe yeah. anything you want to add on that? Yeah. So, you know, thinking about the talent we have in our ranks, thinking about the individuals that are stepping forward to, to do these types of videos, to share their thoughts, to share their skills it is absolutely amazing. I'm extremely proud to be a part of your squad. Each and every one of you that is contributing to this effort, that as we move forward, focusing on eradicating these negative aspects that exist in our culture, these negative aspects of behavior, to highlight the importance, to highlight the positivity and the efforts and the great things that our soldiers do. So, you know, amazing people in our team. And then uh, additionally, the, the MedVid TV team has worked very diligently to produce yet another in the series, the limited edition series of Mythbusters. And as that information keeps coming out, it is just amazing. And, you know, as we move forward looking at the skills that our soldiers and our personnel and, and our ranks have, we've actually challenged them a little bit more and given them a little bit more of a, an acting role. Mm -hmm. And if you haven't seen it yet, take a look at, at the most recent video. I, I don't wanna you know, do the, uh, you know, share all of the important stuff. I don't wanna be that, that person that uh, exposes the twist ending or any other things, but uh, you know, if you're into mad scientists and some other things that, that are happening out there, you might really enjoy this one. So. Uh, you know, since the doc isn't here this week, I do want to share a couple things from, from her, the three W's, wear a mask, watch your distance, and wash your hands. And if you can't wash your hands, use proof hand sanitizers, and don't necessarily try to make your own. There you go. Yeah, definitely. All right. Okay, switching gears. Um, return to the workplace. And uh, uh, I know there's a lot of interest on this, and let's just talk our way through it. Um, before we go down that path, uh, if you watch what's going nationally, going on nationally with, re, with regard to an increase in, in COVID cases at the national level and the global level, uh, in, in Europe particularly, um, it, it looks like we're on, we're on path towards a second wave or we're on the tail end of the first wave. The, the point is, is we got increasing case rates. Uh, and Texas, and particularly San Antonio, has just had a modest increasing tech, uh, uh, case rates. Uh, so we're still looking at executing our return to the workplace plan. Um, on the, and, and remember when I first briefed this, it was two tranches of 14 days each, 50% uh, on uh, each tranche. Um, and then there had to be a number of conditions to be met, you know, decreasing case rate and the ability to, to treat uh, trace uh, and test and right now we have that capability there has been a modest increase in in uh, positivity from 4.9 last week to 5.9 percent 
Our physician, Dr. Pearson, feels that's, that is kind of an anomaly, but we're going to watch it very carefully. So we're going to continue with our return to the workplace plan, uh, which the first assessment period was on the 28th, um, which will be on the 28th of October. Um, and and uh, hold on, I got these dates backward. We're in the, we've already started the first, the first tranche, and I got the dates inverted here on my notes. And I don't have a calendar in front of me, and I never talk dates unless I got a calendar in front of me. So, so let's just say it's underway. And supervisors have the guidance to uh, uh, that what they're supposed to do is look at who needs to be brought back to work. Uh, roughly, we're shooting for roughly 50%, but that is not a hard and fast number. The key thing is our supervisors are supposed to be talking with their personnel to get a sense for what the individual concerns are uh, for each member of the staff. Uh, how are the kids doing in school? Are they in a virtual learning construct? Do the kids have to go to school? Are they single parents? Is there, a, is there just a lot of angst that the, the employee does not feel right coming back to work? Uh, what's the criticality of the work which the team does? Has there, has there been a decrease in productivity? All of these things uh, kind of go into the, the mix, if you will, of, of who we're bringing back. Um, and then we're going to go ahead and, and continue to monitor this uh, for another period, and then we'll be, be looking at bringing folks back to work. Um, the guidance I have given out, and Mr. Harmon had a, 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 a very detailed uh, Microsoft Teams event, I think it was yesterday, uh, with all the supervisors. I think there's over 100 people on that net. Uh, but the, the, he emphasized my guidance is one, communication, what we're doing, uh, two, empathy, and three, be flexible. And those will be kind of our emerging themes uh, as we go through this. Really, what I want to, I've talked to you before, the vision is, and I've said this many times, and I still believe it, uh, we're not going to return to work, we're not going to work in the future the way we've worked in the past. And I think COVID has, has shown us that we can work just as efficiently uh, with, a, with a rotating uh, telework policy, something that offers our employees a lot of flexibility. Um, and our supervisors have a lot of options. You know, is it 50% workplace or 50% telework? Or is it, you know, a rotating t uh, work schedule which brings up, you know, half the force over a certain period of time. So over an accumulative amount of time, they're there roughly 50% of the time. Uh, or is it some of, some of the staff is home, some of the staff is at the workplace, and then that rotates. There's a mix there, and you can see that just with what I described that the possibilities are infinite. We're, I've asked the chief, and you've met her, Colonel Elliott, to, to look for some long-term, more solid plans that, that that we can codify well into the future. And of course, there needs to be a legal review and there's higher policies which we must uh, make sure that we're in compliance to or make an attempt to get adjusted so they can com accommodate uh, our vision with what we want to do. Know that if the positivity rate all of a sudden spikes here in town, we're going to reset and go back to our distributed work model, which we've been doing since March, April, okay? Uh, and, it, and that can really turn on a day or two. Uh, and so we kind of do this gradually. What I ask is that if you're, if you're not a supervisor, uh, is that don't, don't assume that your chain of command knows all the issues that you're contending with. So communicate, and the communication goes both ways. We owe you a plan, you owe us feedback. Um, let us know so that we can empathize and understand uh, what the issue is and how we can develop a flexible means to make accommodation. We still have work we have to do, and this entire team has demonstrated the, that we can accomplish the mission. We've shipped over 7,000 soldiers, not one single one, sick to first unit of assignment, and that's because of all of you. We have to continue this gradual process, and it's kind of it's kind of like uh, being go, tiptoeing into a mountain lake that you're going to go swimming. You, you kind of, it's one toe, one foot, 
up to your knee to test the temperature before you're, you're confident that how far in that you want to go. Um, know that we may be going just a little bit slower than uh, the 502nd Air Base Wing or one of the local companies or businesses downtown because, remember, we want to be deliberate because our number one mission has been, since the beginning of this, protecting the health of the force. Sergeant Major, anything yeah. you wish to amplify? Yeah, so one, once again, thanks to Mr. Harmon for hosting that uh, Supervisors Return to the Workplace Forum to provide information. And uh, it was great to see that uh, so many supervisors actually did tune in and participated in uh, because it shows the care and concern that leaders have for those people that they are privileged to supervise on a daily basis. So, you know, once again, we're not in a rush to get everyone back here. As much as we love you, as much as we want to see your face, make sure that you're doing the right thing. If at any time during this process you feel like you are getting ill, if you feel like you are potentially starting to exhibit some of the symptoms of uh, being infected with COVID, stop. Don't come in at that point. Communicate. Talk with your supervisor. Let them know what's going on. We don't want sick people here in the, in the work environment. And then your supervisors will continue to work with you to make sure that uh, the flexibility of the schedule remains as uh, you move forward to allow you time to Heal, if that is the case, and then safely return back to the workplace. So, supervisors, my message to you, you have the trust and you are empowered to bring back those personnel that you feel are necessary between that 0% and 50%. Doesn't mean that you need to increase it all the way up because you think 100% need to come back, you need to stay within the parameters that's the, the guidance that's given by our commanding general. But if you don't feel like you have to bring folks back, then you don't have to meet those maximum marks. Look at your mission set, figure it out. I know it's hard, it's, it's, it's a huge math problem, it's a huge uh, master's level thought process, whatever it is, but really the people are what we are concerned with and what we need to make sure that we continue to take care of. So. Once again, don't get so wrapped up in dates. They're not that important. What is important is that missions being taken care of, that all of the requirements are being met, and most importantly, that our people are the number one focus of what we're doing and taking into account the realities that life has to offer each one of us. So um, once again, stay vigilant and do your part. And to our workers out there, if for some reason your supervisor is not lending a positive ear to you, if they're not listening to you, then every supervisor has a supervisor. Let them know. We want to know so that way we can take care of our team to make sure that everyone gets back to the workplace safely, but more importantly gets back to their homes and with their families safely because we don't want to be part of a second wave, second surge, or whatever other terminology wants to be used out there. So just stay engaged, stay communicative, and work with each other. Thanks, sir. Well, thanks, Sergeant Major. And I, and I just want to reiterate, reiterate a talking point, which I believe Mr. Harmon shared. Uh, and, and this goes, uh, and this kind of goes to the supervisors. And it says, do not bring in 50% of your employees because you think that is what the CG wants you to do. So if you were to bring in 35 or 25, that's okay. You got to accomplish the mission. If if I am if I am too vague, if I am unclear, reach out and let us know, and we'll provide some clarity. Okay, uh, reach out to Mr. Harmon. Okay, so Tish, we may have ran a little long there, but uh, we'd love to take some questions. Okay, great, sir. Actually, I I will start with a live question. Okay. I think because you have virtually answered this, but again, it's very specific. Uh, I'm a civilian employee. What if I don't feel safe working in the office because of the pandemic? What are our options to continue to work from home? Will there be HEPA filters installed? It's a very detailed question, but they're asking about barriers and other such things. What are the precautions? No, oh, it's a great question, and I totally understand. So let's just talk about a couple of things. One, you know, Mr. Whaley and the G4 team has done a great job in purchasing 
barriers. We're working to get those installed, and I watched that process uh, last week in a couple of offices. I don't know if we have all the offices with, you know, the proper plastic uh, uh, barriers. Um, hand sanitizer is, is everywhere, and then we have lots of masks to go around. Uh, so, uh, and there is also, and, and this is a do out the staff owes me back, is, is what are we doing on, on the filtration system for the HVAC and, and uh, whatnot to make sure that this stuff is not, COVID is not being transmitted through the filtration systems. Um, so, if, if, you, if you are very, very worried about getting sick, uh, I totally understand that. But here's what I would tell you. Kind of look at this, t take a step back, and, and just kind of look at some of the trends uh, that we've had here at, at the office, the Medical Center of Excellence. So um, the team I'm here in this room right now, three of them are behind camera. Uh, but there's a whole bunch of, of folks that uh, we've been working with just every day uh, since, since March, and no one's gotten sick. Uh, we, we practice the rules with the, with the social distancing, the hand washing, and the, and the mask. Uh, but by and large, to the best of my knowledge, I don't recall anybody who has been sick in, in the command group. Uh, and I'm really kind of speaking within the confines of Abel Hall. There has been some employees, just a few though, a handful, uh, instructors uh, down teaching our, our enlisted population. Um, I've flown three times in the last month, and I follow the same rules I just described, and knock on wood, uh, I've, I've been okay, and we continue to, to follow the precautions. Imagine, if you will, that if we all follow the precautions, uh, and we instill those, those barriers that, that I earlier mentioned, uh, and knowing that you know, the, the student population here is a lower risk population. Uh, it's, it's a safer place to work here than it is, say, uh, off post somewhere. Is it a zero risk place? Absolutely not. It's a safer place. So I think that, um, I think that the, the risk is mitigatable. If, if, you're, if, if you are just overcome with fear, uh, let your supervisor know. We'll look, we'll look to, uh, for some way to accommodate you. But we don't want to be consumed by our fear. We don't want to take counsels in our fear. We want to, you know, the thing about fear is fear, fear generates a, an, a, an identification of, a risk, of risks, and then how do you mitigate those risks? Uh, and that's what we're kind of looking at right now. But I, I appreciate the question. Sure, and in, additionally with that, you know, Thinking about that, we, we have had many people in, in our organization that because of their mission, because of the requirements for instruction and in our overall mission as the center of excellence, that have not been able to take advantage of teleworking. They have had to continue to work face-to-face -face with large populations of individuals and as CG stated, very minimal transmission of infection. And there's not going to be any point in time that there will be absolutely no risk of infection. But ultimately, being able to work through the precautions, being vigilant, being confident that the things that you do protect others and that others are doing the same thing as good members of, of a team and as good members of a family, we're all going to take care of each other. So as individually we work through this and, and work through the, the challenges, the fears, the thoughts, the possibilities, as CG stated, don't get consumed by them. I understand that, you know, depending on individuals, some people are more predisposed to uh, being susceptible, but ultimately just the basics that, that our command surgeon has provided to us face coverings, wash hands, and distance when possible, and making sure that you're adhering to that at all times will provide for a safe environment to where we can continue our mission. But ultimately, it gets back to that communication piece, and just know that we do care about you, 
and that if somebody is asking you to come back to the workplace, it's because they value what you do and that your presence is something that is uh, enhancing to our mission set. So uh, I would just encourage you to continue to think about it that way and continue to, to work towards your individual overcoming of, of these challenges. But uh, thanks for the question. Very, very important question. Yeah, and I just, just want to reiterate, it, reiterate, if you have a pre-existing medical condition which puts you at a higher risk category, we need to know that so we can, so we can be supportive. Uh, and then if you're at work and you're feeling ill, we need to know that too. Uh, and so we can make sure you go home uh, and protect the force. Okay. Okay, sir. So if we're going to stick to 30 minutes, we're at the limit. But I do have one. Let, let we can go a little bit, little one bit or two longer. More. Okay, yeah. great, sir. Uh, so this is another live question, and it's lengthy, but I'll kind of abbreviate. Would it be possible to notify when there are positive cases, i.e., the who? The reason is because how do we know that we've been in? contact with a COVID positive? And I think the distinction is contact versus close contact. Yeah, so, so was, that, was that the whole thing? Pretty There's much, much more, but go okay. ahead. Okay, we well, we, we remember we have a HIPAA requirement here, too. And we got to, everybody gets treated with dignity and respect. That's, that's requirement one. And two, we got to be compliant with the law. Uh, that's the second thing, and that's, and that's HIPAA. Um, and so we can't broadcast uh, who has been uh, who's been got sick, who's COVID positive. But what we do have in a discreet way is our, as our surgeon gets with the person who's positive and then they start working the tracing back from that individual back to all the people they've had contact with. So, so if you, if you uh, the person who asked the question uh, had contact with somebody um, who, who was COVID positive and, COVID pos and, and they said, yeah, I was with Mr. Smith, uh, I, I, I saw Mr. Smith, uh, you know, there would be a discussion there because the, the, the tracing, how far it spread, would largely take that discussion to Mr. Smith and Ms. we'd notify Mr. Smith. Uh, Sergeant Major, any, any additional? Yeah, it, it, so, you know, we're, we're not going to broadcast everybody across the net that, that potentially uh, is testing positive, but, but ultimately, uh, understanding that there may be times where you do not know who you're coming in contact with, not necessarily in the workplace, but potentially in other places where you may be frequenting or are attending outside of the workplace. So there, there's always that possibility. So as long as you are protecting yourself and not having prolonged contact with someone within six feet, without masks, then the risk is reduced. And that applies to all situations. So just being aware, being vigilant is probably the best thing that every individual can do. And I know it's, it's hard because the unknown, you know, on, at any given time, I could, you know, be uh, a carrier or, or a CG. But we just don't know, but we continue to protect ourselves. So uh, great question, and it's a hard one to approach. Yeah, and the other, the other thing is just one more, some more emphasis on, on the protective measures. So um, I have visited COVID-positive soldiers at least on three different occasions, and, and uh, uh, it could be said that I was within six feet of them. Um, I will tell you that... Uh, I had the mask on, there was hand washing, uh, and I did not get ill from those engagements. Uh, so this thing I have a high degree of confidence in. Uh, again, not, won't, won't zero out the risk, but it, re, but it, but it lowers it. But you kind of get, my point is, you kind of get a sense that when you are uh, out in higher risk areas, uh, that you kind of get a sense that the precautions that are prescribed, they really do work. And that's, that's my level of confidence in, in the guidance that Dr. Pearson has put out. Uh, and so we'll continue to follow that. Uh, how about one more, Tish? Okay, Th we'll make it a two-parter then. Uh, so we have, we have several live ones. But so it's about holiday block leave. First yeah. of all, are we still doing it? Is yes. it still confirmed so we can book travel for that? And then another parent specifically asked, can a parent pick up an AIT soldier and travel by car if they're within four 
and a half hours of Fort Sam Houston. I don't know where that name, number came from, but that's in the question, so I asked it. So, so uh, for, I don't know if that's with regard to holiday block leave. Okay. Go ahead, Sergeant Major. In, in regard with holiday block leave, you know, so the soldiers, as, as they get ready to depart out of, of the, the COE heading to wherever they're heading, majority of them will be flying. And, you know, the, the, the burden becomes on the soldier themselves to make sure that they are taking care of themselves, doing uh, all of the health protection measures along their travels. Now, if their traveling conveyance changes from plane to privately owned vehicle, then those same parameters should be in place. And once the soldiers are actually departing from the installation, how they travel, whether it's with family members or with taxis or other, other pri or, uh, privately owned conveyance is strictly up to that individual within the parameters of, of legal guidance that they receive uh, prior to leaving from our organization. Yeah. Hey, it's going to be a lot of trust here as we go out on the holiday block leave. Uh, the discipline, I am confident that the, the discipline of our soldiers and the discipline of the Medical Center of Excellence staff has on, on the big three uh, will make sure that, you know, we'll have minimal sick people coming back uh, off of The statistical probability is we're probably going to have one or two, but we have a means to screen and test those soldiers, and if they're ill, they go, they go get treated. We've, we've done this before. Uh, and then we, we have the ability to put them into a 14-day ROM uh, and then continue training virtually so that the graduation dates will not shift to the right. And we'll keep everybody on track when they come back from holiday block leave. But uh, that's how we plan to execute it at this moment in time. And if there are any adjustments to that, we'll let you know in, in the next uh, town hall. However, I do want to tell you, I want to emphasize, holiday block leave is going to happen. Okay, Tish. Just one final comment yep, on that. Yep. So, uh, you know, getting back to the specific question. So, I know that doesn't apply to everyone. Not every family member is four and a half hours away. What I would encourage for your soldier to contact their chain of command, talk to their drill sergeant, their first sergeant, their company commander, and work through the process of gaining approval if that is the pathway that uh, the family wants to execute or assist with uh, transporting their soldier to keep them safe during this holiday block leave period. But ultimately, it starts with uh, that conversation with the soldier and their leadership at their, uh, at their training organization. And we do need to know that because the family may not be able to get on post to pick exactly. up the soldier. Exactly. Okay, so that, that's a tasker, actually. Uh, okay, you know, I think we're at closing comments now. Um, Sergeant Major, any closing comments? Very quickly, because I know we're, we're running on time. So uh, early voting period. It's running from Tuesday, October 13th to Friday, October 30th. So if you intend on voting, do so. Let your voice be heard. Second thing, Army Combat Fitness Test. It is the test of record for all of us in the green suit. So if you haven't been studying, start studying now. The ACFT is not a test you can cram for the night before. You have to have a study plan for the entire year. And by a study plan, I mean doing some exercise each and every day. PT is incredibly important. And the final thing is just remember as we go through all of this stuff, that calm is contagious. And I'm proud to be a part of this organization. Thanks, sir. Ooh, yeah. Uh, and the ACFT is, is fun. It is a lot of fun. Vote, like Sergeant Major says, one more highlight, one more success that you all have contributed to is we had uh, TRADOC's back brief on the Army's quality assurance assessment for the work we do here, and we passed with flying colors. Uh, incredible amount of work went into it, but we are a, we're regarded as a high performing organization and the quality assurance standards which we have set, in other, in other words, the quality of our training and our education is very, very high, and it exceeded Army standards on most all, on all measurable, measured areas. So, like Sergeant Major says, I'm exceptionally proud to be with you. We're doing great, folks. Uh, we're going into uh, the winter here. Get your flu shot. I had mine the other day. Um, 
Continue to be uh, disciplined. We'll get through this together. Calm is contagious, and we'll see you on the high ground.